Today, if you work with children with autism, we are going to dive into language sampling, and I'm going to share with you what you're absolutely going to want to pay attention to, whether you're working with a preschool with autism, whether you're working with a school-age child and a high school-age child with autism. This is the metric that is going to be of crucial importance, and it's based on research that just came out this week, hot off the press. The research is from a $10 million study that's looking at children with autism and speech development. Because the problem is that anywhere between 30 to 40% of children with autism do not develop fluent speech in their lifetimes. The government put $10 million to Helen Tiger Flushberg and her team at Boston University. Now that was 10 years ago. Today, the research is coming out. Whenever an article comes out by Helen Tiger Flussberg, I make sure to pounce on that article and see what's in there. This is some great, great, great stuff that came out of that study. You are rarely, if ever, going to come across studies where you're talking about 100 children with autism and how they develop speech. But this is the study where you're going to find that because this is a $10 million study. And when we're looking at this kind of numbers, we can make some generalizations, which we typically can't do because most studies of children with autism have less children involved than how many fingers you have on your hands. So you can't really generalize that to other populations statistically. But this does give us something that we can bite into. And I can't wait to share it with you. I'll leave the citation in the show notes at the bottom here. So make sure to check it out if you're on YouTube or on a podcast. It's going to be right below. It's that great of an article. Now, let me share with you what you need to know. This study looked at is something known as non generative speech. This is speech where it's echolalic. Someone is repeating someone else's utterance or partial echolalia, where they're repeating partial utterance, or unconventional speech in which they make up words, their jargon that only they understand, or perhaps they're scripting something from a movie or a song or a TV show. That is known as non generative speech. The child is not generating this language that's been taken from some other place or it's jargon, okay? So they're looking at that versus spontaneous speech. Now, spontaneous speech is speech in which the child has spontaneously produced it. It's not repeated from other people or elsewhere. Or perhaps they change something, mitigated echolalia, in which they repeated part of the utterance, changed it, and added their own words to the utterance. Or perhaps they changed the prosody. So I might say, do you want it over here? And they said, over here. Like they told me in a declarative manner, and they changed my rising intonation for the question and made it into a statement. So that would be known as spontaneous speech in which they changed my utterance. In that case, they changed the prosody or they changed the utterance and say, put it over here. They added some other words to it and made it their own. We did research on this in 2021 that we presented at ASHA. I, I put it on ResearchGate and I said, pay attention to the percentage of repetitive utterances. Now that's what I refer to it as. I like what they're doing instead. They're saying pay attention to the percentage of non-generative utterances, the utterances they didn't create themselves that are intelligible and spontaneous. And pay attention to the percentage of utterances that are spontaneous. So what this study found, and this is very important, is that as children become more verbally fluent, they're going to use less and less non-generative speech. They're going to use more spontaneous speech. The children at school age, between the ages of 6 to 21, with the average age for both groups being 12, all 100 children have autism. But we have 50 that are fluently speaking, speaking and 50 that are minimally speaking. So what they found, this is very important, is the percentage of non-generative utterances was key. So when they looked, and now this, and this isn't every child, this is on average. They took the average of those 50 children that were minimally speaking. They found a majority of their utterances were non-generative. So there were children in that group, I want to make this clear, that didn't use 
any non-generative utterances, but they were averaged in, okay? And they were children in that group that only used non-generative utterances, so you're averaged in. They found 56% of their utterances were non-generative and 44% of their utterances were spontaneous. Utterances were non-generative, that were repeated scripts, jargon. The 50 children that were fluently verbal, now this is very different when you look at their numbers. Their numbers were 97% of their utterances were spontaneous, and only 3% of their utterances were non-generative. So you're looking at ages 6 to 21. These are not preschoolers, but just looking in our crystal ball and looking ahead. You're looking at a majority of their utterances. So we're saying 56% of their utterances were non-generative. Okay, so that means they were echolalia, they were scripts, they were jargon, a majority. And only 44% of their utterances were spontaneous. Then we look at the matched group. This is very important to, to pay attention. This is a big difference. And in the matched group, only 3% of their utterances were non-generative, were, were, were scripts or were, were repetitions from other speech. And on average, 97% of them were generative. Now, they too had a lot of variability. So some of the children didn't make any non-generative utterances, and some of the children made quite a few. So we have variability, we're looking at averages within the group. But what that tells us is that this is a metric you wanna pay attention to. What you wanna do at the preschool level, when you do a language sample, you wanna look at what is the percentage of non-generative utterances versus the percentage of spontaneous utterances. You're going to wanna see over time as the child gets older, there's a decrease in the percentage of non-generative utterances in the language sample. And there's an increase in spontaneous utterances. So that is going to be a huge metric when it comes to progress, the group that were verbally fluent. What they found is, is as this group of children became older, they used less and less non-generative utterances and more spontaneous utterances. So they too, when they're younger, they use non-generative utterances. This is good. What I wanna make clear right now is gestalt is not bad. Gestalt is good. Gestalt is how they learn. We want to embrace that. They learn through memorization of chunks of language. Then through natural use over time, they learn to use it spontaneously. We want to embrace Gestalt language, but at the same time, we want to measure it. And we want to see over time less and less of the non-generative speech and more spontaneous speech. That is the progress metric you want to keep your eye on that's going to be huge. They also found in both of the groups, as a general rule, that as you saw more spontaneous speech and less non-generative speech, you also saw a correlation and an increase in receptive vocabulary, a form of language comprehension, and also nonverbal IQ testing. There was a correlation they found in which as you see more spontaneous speech, you also see improvements in language comprehension and cognition. There's something else that was very important and very thought-provoking from the study that I really want to share with you. And it's going to take you a minute to kind of wrap your head around this. But what they found is that the children that were minimally speaking, it was equal when it came to the, their mean length of utterance, which means the length and complexity of their utterances were the same when it came to whether it was spontaneous speech or whether it was the scripted non-generative speech. They were the same in length and complexity and they were the same in vocabulary diversity. So this to me is fascinating. It seems as if there's a leveling off that occurs at the school age level. I feel like there's a leveling off that we really need to pay attention to 
because it adds to other research we know at the preschool level. At the preschool level, what I found in my language sampling with children who are just beginning to talk is that their echolalia is longer than their spontaneous speech. So they might say something in a language sample like, Dora did it. Yeah, you did it. And I give them the speech. However, this is very important. They will pick up something and spontaneously might say, hey, they're speaking at the one word level spontaneously, but they're also giving me those scripts that Dora did it. And what I tend to find is when children are just learning to talk, the scripts are longer than their first word. Now that is a generalization, but that's typically what I find at the preschool level. What we know from the research is that children with autism benefit more from diverse vocabulary and from hearing language of greater length and complexity. So what I found in my work with children with autism, now this is not statistically significant, this is not 100 children, but I can tell you in my clinical expertise, I work with children after they begin speaking on stories and on telling stories using multiple mod modalities, using a gestalt manner of learning in which there's print involved, there's gestures involved, there's repetition involved, there's parentese involved. I embrace the gestalt. The gestalt manner of learning is how they learn. They learn language in these chunks, and these chunks are multimodal. A lot of times they're paired with music. They're paired with animation. They're paired with uh, exaggerated inflection. I take that and I put that in my treatment target, which is a paragraph in length. And I give it to them and we do it together in a multimodal manner, just like Dora the Explorer is multimodal. My therapy is multimodal. Just like Dora the Explorer is using the same phrase, Dora did it over and over and over again. We're using the same paragraph. So embrace how they learn. They're showing this is how I learn language. And then over time, just like these children who are verbally fluent are, it becomes more spontaneous. But we have to understand when we look at this trajectory that the children who are verbally fluent, as they were younger, they used more gestalts. That's how they got to the improvement over time in more spontaneous language. It starts with a script and then it becomes spontaneous. And how does it become spontaneous? It becomes spontaneous through interactions. So for instance, I was just in Portugal and I would keep speaking Spanish in Portugal because the languages are so sim similar. So if I wanted to say, I'm sorry, I would say, lo siento. And then, and then the person would say, oh, disculpe. I learned it's disculpe from those interactions. And in the same manner, when a child uses gestalt language, you have two roles. You're going to be an interpreter and a translator. Now, when you do, when I'm using my paragraph, which is complex, what happens is there's a cascading impact in which the child naturally is producing expanded sentences. When children that are minimally speaking in which their spontaneous utterances are only as long and as complex and as diverse as their gestalts. So what do we want to do? We want to make the gestalts, our treatment targets, more complex. We want to increase the length and complexity of those gestalts. I never taught them sentences. I never taught them expanded sentences. I never taught them compound sentences. I never taught them complex sentences. They naturally developed because we're working in the paragraph. And we're working in the paragraph in this gestalt manner. So what I'm saying here is I'm saying what we see is this leveling off Yes, we're going to provide them with repetition. We're going to want to do everything Dora the Explorer does to make it sticky, to make it catch. And when we do, you have a higher 
cascading impact in which there's a waterfall impact and you're changing the child's linguistic system. You don't want to work at the child's level. You want to work above the child's level. You're, the, the language is not going to develop like a geyser when you're working on simple language. You're not going to have a geyser effect in which you're going to get the natural development of more complex language and more complex vocabulary. You work from a waterfall effect in which you have a more complex target that's taught in a gestalt manner. So that is how I interpret this study. I look at this study and I look at the haves and the have nots. And I say, why have they not developed more complex speech? What, what happened here? They leveled off with where their gestalts were. That's what happened. Now, what happened with the children who are verbally fluent? Their gestalts were actually simpler than their spontaneous language. So they continue to naturally develop. This is a, just an intriguing article. Make sure to check it out yourself. Or if you don't check it out, what I want you to take away from this episode is actually two things. We know from these children, they are teaching us, this is how I learn language. I memorize it first. And after I memorize it, just like you memorize your ABCs and your one, two, threes, I use it generatively. Embrace that. What are they learning? They're learning things from TV shows that are highly animated. They're learning things that are multimodal with music and visuals. They're learning things that have exaggerated intonation and exaggerated emotion. Do that in your treatment target. Embrace that. Be that. What else do we know from the research? We know that more complex language, more diverse vocabulary at the preschool level produces better outcomes for children with autism. When you do that treatment target, make it complex. Give them the good stuff. In the past, I used to go to sentences. I've been doing this for 20 years. Sentences were my go-to when children began speaking. Now it's stories. However, I'm teaching that paragraph in a, in a multimodal, gestalt manner. I'm embracing how they learn language. And as a result, I'm getting great gains. And I'm getting a spontaneous cascading effect in which the child is naturally speaking in sentences. I didn't have to teach that. The child's naturally speaking in compound sentences. The child's naturally developing over time complex sentences because at the paragraph level is where we're working in therapy. This research is fire. And I hope it motivates you to work with your children more intelligently in monitoring the progress they're making in developing spontaneous language and also in capitalizing on the gestalt language processing, on the memorization of words, phrases, commercials, sentences, pieces from videos. Take that and incorporate that into your intervention. That is their superpower. They are showing you this is how I learn language. Third, think about complexity. Seeing that these children level off at the elementary age and what they're able to do in a gestalt is what they're able to do at the spontaneous level. Take the gestalt higher. Don't go for the sentences. Do what I do and go for the stories. Go for a paragraph instead you are going to be amazed when you see the natural progress that happens as a result through the cascading impact. Because we have a waterfall. We're working way up here. We're doing top shelf. I want you to take all of this information, roll up your sleeves, make the world a better place. You are always going to be first.